Hello everyone, welcome back to Solo Board Gaming Presents Battle of the Bulge 1944 Designed by Dan Furney from Worthington And hold it right there Because if you, like me, have become a bit jaded with Battle of the Bulge games. I mean, I think the first Battle of the Bulge game that I played was probably late 80s, mid to late 80s. And it was the Battle of the Bulge, Avalon Hill. And since then, we've had dozens, hundreds, maybe? Battle of the Bulge games and Battle of the Bulge derivative games. Strategic level, operational level, grand strategic level, tactical level every which way but loose so just in case you are a bit jaded by them just hang on give me 10 minutes because i was the same until i saw so many great videos on this so many good reviews i just had to give it a go and i'm so glad that i did so i was going to do a short video on battle of the boards 1944 several days ago but the reason I didn't do is because I kept playing the game. <laughs> it's a brilliant game. So let's start having a look. First of all, it's a top quality game from Worthington. Really good Worthington quality. With a brilliant, fully mounted, high quality board. And ladies and gentlemen, I give you... One of the best counter trays I've seen in a game. I haven't purchased this counter tray. This is the counter tray that comes with the game to put all those lovely, jubbly counters in with a lid. Perfectly organised. So right there, you have Worthington quality oozing out of this product. You have a results pad as well where you can record all your games and look, even a box to tick if you played it solitaire. You have variable objectives, like so, the historical operation, Rundstedt's plan, Martin, spoiling attack, and Hitler's autumn mist, to keep the game fresh. You have an order of battle for the US Army. Well, Allied, really, because there is a, a small 30-core contingent, but that's a late-game thing. Or the German order of battle, on which you can place your counters to make bringing them into the game really easy. And finally, you've got a brilliant full-colour rulebook, which explains the game in less than 12 pages. In fact, I think the rules are something like seven pages. Because despite playing, oh, I haven't played them all, obviously, half a dozen, definitely, over the past couple of decades, uh, Bulge games, I was still interested enough to buy Battle of the Bulge 1944 from Worthington because it looked to me to be such a simple game to play and it solos perfectly. It says on the back of the box for one to two players. And as I said on your results pad, it says there, was it solitaire? Tick this box to remind yourself of the fact. Now, it doesn't have an AI, but it's so simple to play that you can play your entire campaign in two hours. And that seems genuine. And most reviews I've seen, most reviewers also agree with that. And now after uh, four, four games, yeah, after four games, I completely agree. It's a two hour game. In fact, on my first game, the game ended at the end of turn three with a German victory. Yeah. Now, I must admit, since then, I've made sure that hasn't happened again. <laughs> but it's absolutely possible with all these variable objectives and so on. So let's have a closer look at the game. 
So we have a top quality mounted board, which we'll have a, a closer look at in a moment. Covering the majority of the operational area from the Siegfried line, right the way up to the River Mers in the Northwest. And as I said, you've got this real quality counter tray, organizer even I would say, with a lid. I've got the German counters here, all set out in their order of battle. The US counters over this side, uh, the same. Um, in fact, for turn seven, uh, there is also some British 30 core counters, but they play a relatively small part in the battle, uh, as you know, and in fact, on the map, and we will have a closer look at that. And that is to occupy Dinan and Hoy. British 30 Corps can't even cross the Meurs. Most of the action, obviously, by that stage of the game, is going to be taken up by Patton's 3rd Army, pouring in from the south. Then we have the management tokens. All these tokens in the middle here for in supply, out of supply, very important, as you know, certainly for the Germans anyway, in the Bulge campaign, moved and finished. We'll explain these in a second. Uh, attacked and finished. And then brilliantly, we have 1d6, that's simple enough, but 10 attack die. These are for your attack results. Absolutely brilliant. I do love this way of dealing with things. And look, these attack die are only marked on two sides. Four of them are blank. And it uses in the main NATO style symbology. That's an armor hit, the oval, and the cross there is an infantry hit. So there's your attack die now. Let's just take a closer look at some of the counters because I was quite astounded by this. Look at the size of that counter. It's huge. And when I first put them out on the map, it actually took me aback. I just wasn't used to playing with a counter of that size as such. And very, very clear, again, NATO symbology. That's an armoured unit there, of course. Beautifully rounded, thick counter that just pops out of its sprue. We have some allied air power, like so. But as you know, again, weather plays a big part in the Bulge campaign. Superb quality counters there. And finally, as I said, the rule book is absolutely superb. You can read the whole thing in half an hour. It's 12 pages, but that's front cover to back cover. The rules are probably about seven pages long. Once you get past an explanation of unit types, uh, some advanced rules, and look, you've got big charts in here anyway. Uh, that's the terrain. You've got advanced rules like variable weather, German fuel shortage, and then uh, it explains variable objectives, some examples to explain supply. They've even got that in here in a simplified form and some movement and attack graphics there like so. This has been described as an entry level game and absolutely that's how you can use it. If you want to introduce someone to board gaming, to war gaming, it has to be something like this. It's going to take 15 minutes to explain the basic rules. It's going to take two hours to actually play the game. And you're doing it with beautiful top quality components as well. So that's going to impress anyone. And again, you can solo it in an evening, two hours. 
but we'll come on to how that actually plays out, how it actually feels in a few minutes. Closer look at the map time. Okay, nearly all of the mounted board is made up of a map of the area and I'll show you what sort of level it is because over here in the east you have the Siegfried line running down here like this, like this and the River Or, and it runs from Monchot in the north to Etternach in the south. And to further orient you, you have Claveau, Saint-Vith, Baston, Malmedy, Spa, Trois-Point, Marsh, Rochefort, Neuf Chateau. Now you have Hoy and Liège up here in the north. And that big blue line is the Meuse River. Now, at each side, you have the resource point track from 1 to 20 for the Germans over there. And from 1 to 20 for the Allies down here. Because it's all about resources. That's the heart of the game. And along the bottom here, we have the Allied turn track. And again, this is made easy. Can I just zoom in a little bit like so? There you go. Each turn, it shows you how much resource points you have as the US. And you see you start as very little, just six resource points. And you have to spend resource points to carry out action. So you start with very little. You're unprepared. This was not expected. Slowly goes up, 8, 12, 12, 14, 16, 18. And this is where Patton's Third Army are going to come into the battle. 18, 18, 18. And then the weather takes its toll, overcast. Then two rounds of mist. So you just get one air element. And there on turn three, one air element. Then it disappears again. It's overcast, overcast, and so on. And then towards the end of the campaign, or the main part of the campaign anyway, sorry, once you get to December the 23rd, you get three air, three air, three air, because the weather clears. And just look at the detail. The bridges. Like so, all of these are choke points, of course, as are the towns, the woods, the rough. These are the Ardennes hills and forests. Clairvaux, the bridge before and the bridge after, leading to Baston. Absolutely stunning. And all this, of course, is to create those choke points and those traffic jams that the Ardennes battle famously threw up and had to be overcome. You've got charts that are in the rule book, but also repeated on the map. The terrain effects chart. This is an explanation as if one was needed any further about step reduction. We'll cover, cover that shortly. And then you've got the out of supply effects and how you spend resource points. An absolutely superb map, fully functional, crystal clear and just beautiful to play on. Now probably the next thing for us to do is to set up some pieces on the board, set up the game so we can go through some moves, go through the various phases of a turn, examples of movement and combat, so you can see how easily the game flows. Now, talking about setting up the game, on the back of the uh, Order of Battle cards, like so, there is 
a graphical representation of the setups for the US side and the German side. Literally counter by counter, so you can place each counter for setup in its correct place. Honestly, they couldn't make this much easier, could they? So let's get a bit closer in and take a look at those counters. I'll put a one step unit here, a two step unit there. That's a three step unit, a four step unit, and finally a six step unit. Now there are two ways you tell how many steps a unit has. First of all, in the top left corner of a unit, see there, very small numbers, four of four. So that's a full strength unit of a, of a four step unit. There it says three of three. And here on this two step unit, it says two of two, one of one, six of six, which is the biggest unit type in the game. If that's too small for you, take a look at the numbers across the bottom. The amount of steps the unit has, which can also be translated as strength points, is the number in the middle. One step, two steps, three steps, four and six steps. That's the middle number. The number on the left, there is a two, there is a five, is the amount of, the amount of combat dice we roll. Okay, so that big unit there, the first SS Panzer Division, will roll five combat dice. This will roll two, two, four combat dice, three combat dice. And finally, the number on the right is the movement allowance. Infantry there, look, four hexes, the armor, six hexes, six hexes, four hexes. So, just take this one, that's the amount of combat dice, that's the strength points or steps, and that's the movement allowance. That's it. That's almost all you need to know about these units. Now, you can tell that this came from a block game, it's from the Holdfast system. I certainly know of um, uh, Holdfast uh, Pacific, uh, Holdfast Tunisia, um, similar systems in that combat dice were used, um, but the units were blocks, they were block war games. So, and the blocks worked whereby if it was a four step unit, there'd be four dots across the top. There it is, look for instance, full strength. Then you'd turn it to three dots, then two dots, then one dot and then it's eliminated, that kind of thing. Well, not too dissimilar here, but it's with counters. And the great thing about this is you've got enormous counters and also there's no stacking. One counter for one hex, that's it, no stacking. So it's a low counter density on the map. And if you take this one, which is a one step unit, look, the number in the middle, when that takes a hit, Okay, an armoured hit, for instance. It's turned over, but it's eliminated because it's only one step. It's gone. Eliminated. Easy as that. A two-step unit. Here it is, look in the middle, two strength points. That gets hit. It gets turned over. And now it's a one-step unit. It still has some strength left. And even at the beginning of the next turn, we can deploy some of our precious resource points to refit a unit, for instance, by one step, repair that unit back up to a two-step unit. Okay, a three-step unit, it takes its first hit. You turn it over, and it's now a two-step unit. There it is, two of three, a two-step unit. If it gets hit again, that's when you return to your order a battle pad, you remove that and you replace it with the one step that's remaining. 
So it's had two hits, bang, bang. And now it has one step remaining. If that gets hit again, it's eliminated. Similar for a four step unit. And there's a lot of these in the game. There's a four step unit, say so in the corner and in the middle there, gets hit the first time, gets turned over. It's now a three step unit, gets hit again. You remove it. It's now a two step unit, two of four, gets hit again. It's now a one step unit, gets hit again and it's eliminated. And the only other thing to show you with that, this beautiful simplicity, this is the first SS Panzer Division of the 6th Panzer Army. Very powerful. It uses five attack die. It has six strength points or six steps and it can move six hexes. Doubled along the road, but we'll show that when we come to it. So it gets hit and it's replaced by four of six. It's now got four strength points. The number of combat dice has gone down slightly. It gets hit again. It's now a three step unit. And now there's a third counter for this. This is two of six and so on. There it is. There's its final step before it gets eliminated. Hope you enjoy the simplicity of that. It makes for a brilliantly fast game. So easily understood. Now let's set up for our game demonstration. So here we are all set up for the start of a game. We've got the US forces, very thin look. See how thin they are. Set up here, slightly to the west of the river Or and the Siegfried line. We have the first army up here in this pale blue. The others here in the light green. The Germans set up much more numerous. You'll find actually that the Germans don't have a lot of reinforcements. A lot of what you start with as a German player happens to be more or less your main force for the majority of the game. There are reinforcements, but nowhere near the number of American reinforcements. For instance. So you do have to make the most of what you start with. And in the gray here, they start with the sixth Panzer Army, the fifth Panzer Army in yellow, and the seventh army here in this pink color. There's an excellent reason for those colors. It helps with setup, but also with resource points and support allocation, things like that. I'll show you that in a moment. A significant point of interest for the American forces is that most of them are single step units. Look at this, one step, one step. Okay, this is a four step unit, one, one. Very few troops, thinly spread, one. There's another four step unit, full strength there, one, one. This is quite strong here. There's two four step units and then one. Germans very different. They're all two step, four step, three step, and even the amazing six steps of the first SS Panzer Division Leibstandarte. You also got the 12th SS there, the Hitler Jugend. That's a four step unit. So this is a strong army here at the top, the sixth Panzer Army in the middle. We have the fifth Panzer Army, again with some elite troops, really experienced armored units, 116th Panzer, for instance, second Panzer. And of course, Panzer Lehr, originally the Panzer training unit. So that unit is made up of a core of a cadre of really experienced instructors. But as in all the divisions by this time, padded out with a lot of young and inexperienced troops. Now at this stage during setup, the US forces don't have any artillery that can help out. The Germans do. They have an artillery unit here that's just kept off board that can donate one die 
to a particular attack. We'll look at that. And we have, there we go. Fifth Panzer Army also have an artillery unit color coded. So it is dedicated to the Fifth Panzer Army. It is dedicated to the Sixth Panzer Army. And down here we have the artillery in pink dedicated to the Seventh Army at the bottom. And also one more thing you may have noticed, Manteuffel. Yes, dedicated, there's the yellow, to the Fifth Panzer Army. If we add him to a unit, it can plus one to the movement points. Come on, drive forward, drive forward, or plus one die in combat. And again, to be sparingly used, he too, like the artillery, is kept just off the board. And the great thing about this is, as I said before, it's one hex, one counter. There's no stacking at all. And you'll see when we come to combat, for instance, yes, it's somewhat abstracted, but basically, and within reason, does give a similar feel, a similar outcome, as would going through pages and pages of charts, percentage rolls, die roll modifiers, as we do in games that have many more layers of chrome. This has its own chrome, small bits of detail to give us tantalizing little glimpses into the battle. And of course, the other great point about it is whether you're playing the US or whether you're playing Germany or playing it solo, like I have been, there's no guarantee who's gonna win. You can still win as the US forces if you get through those early turns. And in fact, I'd say if you can get through to turn four, the chances are you can hold on until more of your reinforcements come on in turn six and seven. The Germans though, they really have got to plow through for an early victory. And there are various victory points available, depending on when you, whether you want to play all 10 turns of the historical campaign, or just six turns or seven turns where the Germans are given variable and different objectives.